Okay, so we're here tonight mm -hmm. and we're talking about another steamy question for sex, right? <laughs> um, so this is a question we get a lot of times yep. in marriages. This is in marriages. Yes. Is that, is porn acceptable in my marriage? It's me and my husband, is it okay? Yeah, so we have, you know, a covenant marriage. We're doing sex, how God designed it to between our marriage of a man and a woman. So yeah, so we just wanna we just wanna spice things spicy. up. Yeah, we just wanna, spicy. you know, do something a little bit different. We heard it's more fun, other couples do, you know, but yep. is porn even in a marital setting? Is it is it wrong? And so I wanna look at Hebrews thirteen four. The first part of Hebrews thirteen four is let marriage be held in honor among all. So again, God designed it, one marriage of a man and woman to be pleasurable, to be something that you guys enjoy. And any time that we go outside of that and we try to look for more, it's it's not it's not gonna turn out well because if you continue on in Hebrews 13, 4, it says, let the marriage bed be undefiled, which means for it to be pure. And you know, porn is shameful. Um, you know, porn is something that we do in secret, we do in the dark. It's not a public thing, you know, and we don't really walk around our community, you know, seeing people just watching, you know, porn while we're sitting by them in a restaurant, things like that. Um, so it's shameful, that's why we do in the dark. And so, but the way God designed it, it's not supposed to be shameful. It's supposed to be held in a place of honor. So porn is wrong. It is a sin. You know, Jesus talks about in the New Testament that if you lust after another, you've already committed that act. So if you're watching porn and you're not married, you're already committing digital fornication, which is sex before marriage. If you are married and y'all are just trying to spice it up and we're going to watch something, you're bringing some other act, some other people into your into that marriage bed that's supposed to be undefiled. You're already committing digital adultery with watching that porn. Because the truth is, is that Porn itself is a lustful act yeah. and marriage doesn't fix um, our lust. Yes. And actually when we bring um, porn and those things into our marriage, um, those are lustful things and it just causes our desire for lust to go yeah. up. The Bible says to flee lustful things. Yes. And so the only way to get out, get lust away from us is to get away from lust. Yeah. And we have to run away from it. When you bring things into your marital bed that are porn and lustful things, that doesn't um, help your marriage at yeah. all. Um, and it doesn't also doesn't satisfy you. Yeah. And so um, in of uh, Colossians 3, 5, it says this, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. And so these are actually desires lurking within us yeah. and we have to put those to death, which is just fleeing from them and yep. getting away from them. And sometimes, um, unfortunately, that takes some time yeah. to be able to clear our minds after we have brought something in. So you're like, oh gosh, I've already brought this in. Now what do I do? Um, if you, if the Bible promises, if you flee that, it will go away. And so you have yeah. to flee from those things, get rid of them. And sometimes it takes a while for your mind and your heart to catch up. Yeah. With those well, you know, things. it talks about in that verse, we're talking about flee, you know, from lust. It talks about nothing, like the uh, sexual said, nothing so more affects the body and the soul than that. Yeah. And, you know, so it does take time, you know, but if you keep fleeing, God will meet you there. He'll meet you with your heart and with your mind and things like that. So, yeah, just flee from it. Yeah, so flee from it. Get away. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Real Women, uh, this is Stacy Harness here at Real Women, and we are talking this semester about the taboo topic a lot of times in churches of sex, and we have really walked through a lot of different things this semester. And the first night we talked about um, dispelling the lies about sex. And we really looked at, instead of looking at our own way that we look at sex, like maybe it's been formed from the world or around us or as we've grown up or things that have happened to us in the past, we're looking at what God who created sex, right? Um, we're looking at how he views sex and what he created sex for. And the week two, we talked about that sex being super sticky. And the reason why it's super sticky is to stick us together with our um, mate, our husband and a wife in a covenant marriage with God for a lifetime. And it takes a lot of glue to stick that together for a lifetime, right? And so sex is super sticky. And that is why. And then last week, we actually talked about my secret. And we realized that we all have some hidden sin in different areas of our lives. Lives, and maybe we have some hidden sin in the area of sex in our lives. And we talked about how to protect that wound that maybe we had from when we were younger or uh, maybe 
prior to the relationship we're in now or whatever, protecting that wound so that then God can heal that wound. And tonight we're going to kind of follow up with that, but we're also going to talk about um, choosing freedom. And now we've really unearthed some really hard things this semester. And pretty much in everybody's life, we've had to step back and take a real look at ourselves and our life that has to do with sex. And we have discovered some things, some of us, and some of those things we need to find freedom from. And we're going to talk about that tonight. How do we find freedom from the things that have tripped us up about sex in our lives? And so Proverbs 28, 13 says this. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. See, there's this problem with realizing we have a sin problem, realizing we have a problem with sex in some way, and then concealing it and hiding it. Um, it, it doesn't lend to us prospering, right? And so we're supposed to confess and we're supposed to renounce that. And then we find God's mercy there when we confess those things. And so when we don't confess, when we keep those things, when we conceal those things, what often happens is what we're going to talk about a lot tonight. And that is shame and the definition of shame, because I think it's been given a lot of different definitions over the, at least my lifetime, uh, but the actual definition for shame is this, a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consequences of wrong or foolish behavior. And I think we have to look at this, how did shame begin? So that was a regular definition, like a Google definition, which talks about just shame itself and the feeling of humiliation and distress that Oftentimes our choices and the consequences of our choices make on us. But where does the biblical beginning of shame start? And so let's start there tonight in Genesis 2, 25, which we're talking about the creation story. Let's look at what the Bible says about shame. It says the man and his wife, talking about Adam and Eve, the first people that were created by God, were both naked and they felt no shame. So here we see before there is any shame in the world, um, this is the starting place where there is no shame. And they were naked. They were naked physically, but I also think they were naked spiritually. They were naked um, in emotionally. And they felt no shame whatsoever because sin had not entered yet. Now, when sin, sin enters, let's look at what happens then. And if you'll go on down um, to Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, you'll see this. Then, now this is after they've taken from the forbidden fruit, right? That God says, don't eat from that tree. That's the only one that you can't eat from. And what do we all do? We eat from the tree, right? Adam and Eve did that. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord. They hid from the Lord. Why did they hide? Because for the first time, they felt shame. They felt that they had done something that they shouldn't have done. And even though, though that they probably knew that God knew, they still felt shame over what they had done. And I want to ask you in your life, especially your sexual areas, that's what we're talking about. Are there things that you are ashamed of that maybe you've done in the past or maybe were done to you and you're concealing those and it might be causing some shame in your life. Now, I want to talk and make sure that we understand that shame and conviction are different. Okay. Sometimes there is an a good godly conviction that comes when we make mistakes in our life or when we even sin uh, knowingly sin, we, uh, we have, sometimes there's conviction from God, or I would say always, there's conviction from God when you know Jesus as your savior. And God gives us that conviction so that we stop doing the things that are against him, or we stop doing the things that are going to hurt us because it's better for us if we don't do those things, right? And it's better for our relationship with God if we actually um, don't do those things. And so there is a healthy place of conviction that absolutely comes from God. And we can respect that conviction and we can prayerfully 
prayerfully, we can go after that conviction and be like, yes, I want to change God because you have brought conviction in my life through your word. Me looking at your word, reading your word, I understand and I'm convicted by your word. Now, the other side of that is there is shame. And shame, although sometimes we'll feel similar from the conviction, is very, very different. Shame says, I'm concealing something from God, I think, um, even though he knows. I'm concealing something, and then the enemy ha- makes us to feel actually uh, shameful about it. The enemy uses that as a weapon against us. And so how... Do we hide from God and from others sometimes? What are we ashamed of? What is the the shame that the enemy is trying to put upon us for something maybe that has happened to us in the past? And I think there's a a Satan's shameful cycle that he just uh, absolutely comes after us with. And he comes after me with this all the time. I believe he comes after people with his cycle, okay? It's a shameful cycle that he is thinks he's in charge of, okay? And this is, first of all, we experience something deeply painful, okay? And there are just some painful things in our sexual life, right? Um, whether you did it or whether it was done to you, we experience something in sex that is deeply painful. And then, and here's where the unfortunate part comes in, and this is where the enemy tricks us. We connect what happened with who we are. So there's this what happened, right? And then there's who we are. And this is our identity, right? And this is just things that either happened to us or that we did, all right? And what the enemy does is Satan's shameful cycle is what he does is he tries to marry the two together and make them one. And so the things that we did, he tries to make them our identity. And so I want to think about you to think about this for a minute in a, a kind of a layman's term on this. Okay. Think about this. My husband goes out sometimes in the yard and for some reason he starts fires. <laughs> I'm not really sure why. Like I think all men kind of like to start fires for some reason. And sometimes uh, those fires can get out of hand a little bit. Um, I won't say that maybe we've had the fire department called before to our house, but thank goodness they were able to put it out. Um, but there, but oftentimes there will be my husband out in the yard putting out a fire, right? And so, yes, he's using a water hose. He's using whatever he needs to to get that fire out. Now, if we have a big fire, which may have happened before, and we call the fire department to come help put that out, which they did, um, then the firemen come out and they are paid. They are trained. That is their job. That is their identity in work life is in their career is to be a fireman, right? That is their identity, at least in work. Okay. Now they're doing the same thing, but one is just doing the activity and one sees it as their identity, right? At least their identity in their work. And so it's kind of the same thing with like a professional sports person. So I may go play a round of sports, <laughs> uh, basketball, scary, or maybe volleyball or something like that. And I am a person playing a sport, right? But a professional athlete would say that was his identity, right? Is that I am a professional sports player, okay? There's a difference between things that we do and things that we are, okay? And what Satan will try to do in his shameful cycle on us is he will try to bring those two and marry them together. And unfortunately, what happens is is the third part of this, which is that we become a prisoner tormented by our past, letting it affect our present. And so... When it becomes our identity, then we move into, we move from one relationship into another relationship and we drag the things from the past into our new relationship. And then that one ends and we drag them into our future relationship because we haven't healed from those things. And now they have somehow in this part of shame become 
our identity. And sometimes we think, well, gosh, we can't even change that because I mean, this is just the way I am now because I have been through this and now I feel guilt and shame and I'm hiding this. And we often become what we think of as a prisoner. Like I can't escape this. But here is the absolute beautiful truth. Christ died for me and you. Christ died for me and you. And there are strongholds in our life that only Christ can break. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4. It says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. Divine power to demolish strongholds strongholds. So how do we break free, right? Don't you want to be free of that shame, that guilt, that Satan cycle that he has us in? Don't you want to be done with that? I know that I do. And how do you break free? And the question you have to first ask yourself and make sure is that, do I want to break free? (laughs) Like that's the first thing is, do I want to break free? And if you say, yes, I absolutely know that I am ready to be done with this shameful cycle in my life. Um, The first thing, there's two things we have to do. And first is we have to realize that we can't change our past. Unfortunately, we love to. I'd love to go back and change some of the things that I did before, but they were all building me into who I am today and my relationship with Christ today. And, And it doesn't matter. I can't change those things. Uh, There's a story in the Bible, and Scott used this the very first weekend that he talked about sex. And if you were in the services, you heard him talk about the story of King David. And King David was, he's the the little boy that grew up that that slew the giant. Um, He grew up to be a king. And King David, uh, long story short, basically what he does is he, when the kings went to war uh, in the spring, when he should have been going to war, he pulled back and stayed back and he let everybody else go to war. And he stayed home, and when he was home, he went out onto his rooftop he, at night, and he looked at the ladies that were on top of the roofs bathing, because that's what they did back then at night. There wasn't supposed to be anybody up there looking, but he was. And when he did, he saw a woman that he wanted. He brought her to the palace. He had sex with her, and she became pregnant. Uh, he called for her husband, who was on the front line fighting for him, and brought him back to the kingdom Uh, to be with his wife so that he could get out of the fact that he slept with her and got her pregnant. And unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, uh, her husband wouldn't sleep with her. He still wanted to protect the king. And so uh, then because of that, um, he knew he couldn't get out of his sin or hide his sin that way. And so what King David did was sent Uriah, her husband, to the front line and then had him killed. And so then he was able to bring the uh, Uriah's wife into his kingdom and they have the baby. Well, when they have the baby, the baby becomes sick and the baby's really, really sick. And when the baby is so sick, King David is um, trying to fast and pray and he lays down on the ground and he he just uh, really goes into this uh, grieving of, of his child and what is happening with his child and praying for God to change it. But then the moment that his child dies, um, he jumps up He goes to shower, he eats, he dresses, he begins talking again, he is walking around and people are like, but wait a minute, how could you be so upset then and now that your child is gone, um, you're you're okay. You're like, you seem to be okay. And this is what he says in 2 Samuel 12, 22 through 23. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Here's the thing. The past, no matter how painful, is in the past. And there's nothing we can do to change the past itself. And I know for me, sometimes I redo, um, gosh, conversations I have with people in my head. Uh, Like I will think about the conversation I had, like, oh, I should have said that but it's in the past, right? Or I should have done that, 
but it's in the past. I rework things in my head over and over and over again. But honestly, the truth is I can't go back and change those things from the past. And if we want to break free from this shameful cycle, if we want to break free from shame in our lives, from letting it affect our present and our future, we have to break free um, by realizing we cannot change the past. And you can't either. You can't change the past either. And we are not our sin. We are not the things that we've done. We cannot let our identity get wrapped up in the things that we're done and let that become our identity. We have to let the past go. The other thing that we have to do is we have to realize that Christ can change our future. And this is in Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So right there, it says that in all things, that means some good things, but that means also some bad things. That means some things that happened in the past that were bad. God can still work through those things. Things. And people ask me all the time, does God cause bad things to happen? And I would say, no, God does not cause bad things to happen. There's evil in this world and the enemy absolutely comes after us. And also our flesh cause, I mean, there's all kinds of choices that we make. We have free will. Um, there are bad things that happen, but this is God's promise in Romans 8, 28, that he will make all all things. He will take all things and he will work them together for good for those who love him. So even when I have something from my past, I look back and I say, those things were not good. I can look at those things and say, my child being born with a birth defect was not good. I can say that my three um, adopted children, their parents dying was not good. Like I can look back and say, we had a house fire and lost everything. And that was not good. But you know what? God has brought every one of those situations around for the good of the people involved in those situations. And those are crazy words to say sometimes, right? But it's God's promise that if we let him use our past, that he will make it into something good for our future. Sometimes what happens though is, is we hold on to our past and that shameful cycle starts and it becomes our identity. And then Christ can't use it because we've got it all wrapped up in our identity, right? But if we can break free from the past and realize that the past is in the past and let God just use the pieces of it to make good for the future, letting God do that, not us, then Christ can change our future. And at every level, there's another devil, right? And God always says that. But in my life, I've looked back and I've realized as I've gone along, when I would be in despair over something, I would realize that God had actually prepared me for this season of life by letting me go through the last season of life and me being able to learn from it, grow from it, and God use it in my life. Now, sometimes I've done that well, and sometimes I haven't done that so well, right? Depending on the situation. But God prepares us for the next part of our life, and he can change our future if we get rid of the past. And I want you to look at Job 11, 13 through 16. And this is going to kind of sum up all that we have been talking about this semester. And it says this, yet if you devote your heart to God, that means that if you know Jesus as your savior and stretch out your hands to him, meaning God, take my life and do with it what you will. If you put away the sin that is in your hand, so whatever the sin is that you are going through, and allow no evil to dwell in your tent. Now, dwelling means taking root there, okay? Dwelling means being there in that place, all right? So it's not that we're going to be sinless. It's not that we're not going to make mistakes. It's not that we're gonna not going to do the wrong things sometimes, but it's not a lifestyle of sin that takes us over, that, that, we're, that is dwelling in our tent, okay? If we allow that, don't allow that to happen, then you will lift up your face without shame. You will stand firm and without fear, you will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as waters gone by. So it's getting rid of the past, getting rid of that 
shameful cycle, confessing what has happened, confessing what you've done, forgiving the person that has done that to you, or forgiving yourself for what you did. Those are the things that when you do those things and when God moves and you protect the wound, like we talked about last week and God heals, then he is able to help us in the future to, for us to be a completely different person than what we were when we were going through those things before. And we'll look at those things in the past, not as, oh my gosh, I hate, ugh, that's just sickening to me. I'm just, I'm such a bad person. Not as your identity, but you'll look at it as, yes, those things happened to me but they're like waters gone by. Like I learned from them. I took what I needed to from them, but God has made something amazing happen from them. You are not your sin. See, when Jesus died on that cross, he took all that baggage, that Samsonite luggage that we carry, he took it all. We, we took it to the cross and we drop it off with him at the cross. And he said, I'll take that and I'll take that and I'll take that bad thing, and I'll take that thing that happened to you. I'll take all of that onto me. And then he forgives us in this amazing way. He takes our sin onto him. And then he rose on the third day. What a beautiful picture showing that he was victorious over sin and death. And so we can trust him with the things that we have done. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 29, this is where we're at right now. And, and today I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I really know the God that forgives like this? Do I really know the God that will take everything? If I'm, if I'm his child, will take everything and make it for good. Do we, I really know him? Because Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 29 says this, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Don't you want to not have that burden anymore? Don't you want to not have that shame cycle anymore? Don't you want to be able to let the past go to forgive those people, to forgive yourself? Don't you want to be able to do that so that you can move on healthy with your relationships, move on healthy in the future? Are we still going to make mistakes? Absolutely. Are we still going to sin? Yes, it's part of this flesh. But Jesus can take all of that on himself, and then he switches out the burdens. We bring him these heavy burdens, and then he gives us his light, refreshing heart, his light, refreshing soul, and we find rest. We find rest. And wouldn't it be nice just to have some rest and some peace for our soul? That's what God is offering to us. And so the question tonight for you is, are you hiding something? Is there something you need to confess? Are you, have you taken on something as your identity that's really not your identity? Because when you're in Christ, your identity is in Christ. When you know Christ as your Savior, you are in Christ. And all these other things are just things that happen and things that we do wrong and all those things, but they're not our identity when we know Christ. There's one last scripture, it's John 8, 36, and it says this, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free. It doesn't say if money sets you free, because sometimes money can make things easier for us in life, but it's really not setting us free. Does it say if you get that job? Does it say if you can marry that guy, if you get that good relationship? Does it say if you have a child? Does it say if you have those things you've been longing for? It says if the Son sets you free, Jesus Christ, then you will be free indeed. Don't you want some freedom? Don't you want some freedom from the things that maybe you've done wrong or have been done to you? Don't you want some freedom from those things? And we're going to fill out a form tonight in Real Women. And it's going to talk about tonight, I choose freedom. Tonight, I choose freedom. And I want to ask you, what are you choosing freedom from? Sometimes it's good to, to name it, confess it, talk about it with someone that you trust. Get in with counseling with someone if you need it and be able to walk out of that shameful cycle and walk into 
the freedom that only Christ can bring. Let your burdens be light by bringing them to Christ and letting him give you his rest for your soul. I pray that this semester you've been able to let some things go. You've been able to see some things that maybe you've never seen before and that maybe you'll walk um, in your walk with Christ a little differently than you had before this semester. Let me pray with you. Dear Lord God, I, we just come to you. We thank you for this semester. We thank you, God, for what you've already done. We thank you, God, for our heart that you give us to be able to um, chase after you, God, uh, with our soul that we just want to we just want to be with you. And Lord, uh, these things that separate us from you, like sin and, and, and just lead us to death in so many different ways, God, we ask you to help us to put those away, to break this shameful sin cycle, and Lord, to be able to just uh, give that all to you and you give us us, uh, your burdens, which are so light. And Lord, um, we just thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the way that you love us. And we thank you that in Christ, in your son, we are a new creation and that we can live a new way because of what you have done for us on the cross. We love you so much, God. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' precious name, I pray. All right, ladies, until next time, read your Bible, pray, and I'll see you soon.